All right, so now let's let's get into the work part of it. Okay. This part that apparently has no meaning or no, it has lots of meaning, but no significance. No, uh, no. <laughs> no it has significance in a global sense, in a cosmic sense, in a in a in a in a in a, in a existential sense. But yeah. but it doesn't, it won't cause a better toaster to be built. And you know that's one of the problems w with science is that it has practical utility. It's obviously not a problem because we couldn't be doing this show. We wouldn't people wouldn't live as long as they live. All, our modern society is based on the results of science. But because science produces technology that changes our lives, people suddenly think that unless it's related to the technology, it's not interesting. Whereas, as I say, art doesn't produce anything practical, so people don't expect. They're not going to say, you know what, that Picasso painting hasn't produced something that makes me live longer. Right. And, but, and so because science has that practical side, people forget the cultural side, the, the, the knowledge side. And that's, to me, as, as important as anything. I, what I've... I've quoted a number of times, and, uh, but I'll quote it again here, one of my favorite statements from a guy named Robert Wilson, who was the, director of the, the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, which is a particle accelerator near Chicago, which accelerates particles to look at fundamental structure matter. It was the largest such machine in the world until the Large Hadron Collider was built in, in Geneva. But when it was being built, he was called by Congress to testify, and he was asked, will it aid in the defense of the nation? He gave a beautiful statement, but the, the end of it was basically, no, it won't help aid in the defense of the nation. It'll just help keep the nation worth defending. Ah, that, that's, me that is, actually is really beautiful. I think it is, so that's yeah. why I, I quote him. So that's sort of, it, it, it's a problem of funding things in a way, because if you fund something, people want results, and what you're saying is basically the whole playground of science isn't tied into that. And well, so it's a real a, problem a, now in government funding and in the public. People seem to want to fund things based on, in fact, I wrote another piece on the House Science Committee, which basically wanted to require, and, and did to some extent, scientists in their grant applications to justify why what they're doing is in the national interest. And the na and which what doesn't I, necessarily have anything to do with science. Well, the point is, that it seems to me, the, natural, the national interest is in increasing our knowledge. Yeah. And, and it's not in, and so if you, if you require things directly to have a practical application, then you're gonna miss almost everything. You, it's already been well documented that probably 50% of the current gross national product of this country is based on fundamental curiosity-driven research that, uh, that was done a generation ago. Accidents, you know, discovery of penicillin, they weren't looking for antibiotics. Uh, even the development of the transistor wasn't... If, if people had said, we want, need to make better computers back at the time when they were using wheels and other things, and they would have missed the use of transistors. So all of the things that have changed our lives, even the World Wide Web, which was developed... At, at Geneva, the home of the Large Hadron Collider, mm -hmm. uh, to help scientists communicate in large experiments when you have 10,000 scientists around the world, it was important for them to be able to exchange results without worrying about where the results were and being able to communicate. That's what developed the World Wide Web, and of course, that's changed the world. So you need to support fundamental curiosity-driven research. If you stop doing that, then not only do we suffer as a species by le not, our learning going not increasing, but ultimately, the spin-offs that are going to change our lives are not going to occur. Yeah. So you mentioned Carl Sagan before, and my, my scientific awakening was a little slow. I hate to admit it. Okay. I was always into sci-fi when I was growing up and Star yeah. Wars and all that stuff. But my real scientific awakening, I saw the movie Contact, mm -hmm. and I had eaten pot brownies before, oh, okay. and I thought I was going to see, I think, Air Force One, but it was sold out. Mm -hmm. So I just went into it's Contact. I had no idea what it was about. Didn't really know much about Carl Sagan, but you know the opening panorama of yeah. the universe. Yeah. And my mind on pop brownies, I mean, Perfect. It, it exploded. <laughs> I since have read every Carl Sagan book and all that kind of stuff. Um, what, what was that moment for you? I suspect it was a lot younger than it was for It was. Me. I was a little younger and a lot earlier because I'm yeah. a lot older. But um, <laughs> actually, you know, well, I, I, it's hard. It, it, I'm not sure there was an epiphany in that way. But there was a, but the first thing I can remember was when I was um, in grade six um, reading a book about Galileo. And... Um, and, and, and it seemed romantic and remarkable uh, to me. The fact that he was the first one to look up at the at moons of Jupiter and it changed everything. And, and also the courage he had, at, or, or lack thereof at times, to, to confront conventional wisdom. That seemed to me to be a romantic adventure that captured my imagination. And that's probably one of the reasons why I write books, is because it was books about him, and then books by people like Isaac Asimov, well before Carl Sagan, but, mm -hmm. uh, and George Gamow, 
and Albert Einstein, and then Richard, Richard Feynman, books by people like that got me excited as a young person about the, the romantic adventure to be the, to, to, to be the first to understand something new about the world. And, and so I returned the favor, and I'm old enough now that it's, for me, very satisfying, although a little depressing to think how old I am when, <laughs> when I meet scientists now who say, you know, I read the physics of Star Trek, and that's what turned me into being a scientist. So, um, but it was those popular books, and, I, and that's why, although it takes time out of, out of my research directly, it, uh, I'm not sure which is more useful in the long run. And besides, I don't have control. I, ha I have to do what I have to do when writing is one of them. But, but it's very satisfying to be able to connect because the importance of a university or of the research enterprise is twofold. And that's one of the reasons why my Origins Project is twofold. University, research universities should be based on the creation of knowledge. But if you don't disseminate the knowledge, it's impotent. So it has to be two, twofold. And, and so... I like to be involved in both for some reason. Yeah, so the Origins Project, you're trying to figure out the origins of humans and the universe. And we're looking at the origins of everything. It's, re it's a wonderful playground because we look at everything from the origins of the universe to the origins of life to the origins of violence. And, and, and uh, uh, um, we're, we're, having, we're having, and the origins of the future. We're having a workshop uh, uh, in, in February on, the, on AI and its challenges. So it's, if you think about it, Forefront questions, there's a relationship always between the future and the past, and forefront questions are always based about the origin. What's the origin of disease? What's the origin of, of intelligence? And so, as a curious person, I can go well beyond just my area of, of physics, which tends to be more related to the origin of the universe, and which has got me into it, to all these other questions. I'm, it's like a kid in a candy shop. I get to meet and work with the most interesting people in the world and learn a lot about a lot of things. So. It's just, it's really self-indulgence, which is mo most of my life is based on. But it's bringing a lot of good to a lot of people. So well, maybe, maybe. self-indulgence and, and individuality well, is good? Yeah, well, you know, that's the other thing I guess I want to say is that most people become scientists not because they want to save the world. It's because they like doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. And, and, there's not, and, and that's fine. I, I tell kids, that's when they talk, ask me what they should do, I say, do what you enjoy, because if you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna do it well anyway. Yeah. But I do science, you know, it's great if it has an impact in one way or another, but I do it because I enjoy it. And, and, that, and, I, and I, I'm unabashed about that. Yeah, so I'm very proud that on this show, I, which I try to bring on people of all kinds of beliefs and, and political persuasions and all yeah. that stuff, I get tons of email from religious people, even though they know that I'm not a believer and uh -huh. all that stuff. So we don't have to dive too much into the atheism thing, but can you, <laughs> how about you give me the best sell job in like three minutes on, on the Big Bang? Like just something that someone that, that is a believer of religion could say, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's some. Well, uh, the point is that it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's sad that I have to do that because. Did I lead the, too much with that question? Maybe I should untangle them. No, 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 just... but I mean, it, 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 one makes it sound like the Big Bang is on a different footing than the fact that the Earth is round. <laughs> it's not. The Big Bang happened. Same with evolution. It's not, you know, people get hung up in the word theory. Well, you know, someone just wrote me and said, well, you know, it's a theory. And I said, well, gravity's a theory too. So if you don't believe it, walk out the 10th floor of a window. <laughs> it's, but the point is a theory in science means it's been tested. Theory is a very high level in science. It means it's satisfied the test of experiment over and over and over again. And the fact that the, the universe began it, it, the, that the universe was once smaller than it is today and smaller and smaller and smaller and was once contained in a microscopic region 13.8 billion years ago that expanded dramatically is, is, is a fact. And, it, and everything we, see, we recognize about the universe is only understandable in, in that context. There are lots of independent ways to measure the age of the universe and we come up with 13.8 billion years. We measure the fact the universe is expanding Working backwards, it was once smaller than it is. And if we extrapolate back and say what happened when it was smaller, we make predictions about things that we hadn't seen before. People say evolution or the Big Bang are historical science because no one was around. They often write me, no one was around to know, so how do you know? And I say, well, the point is all science is historical because all science is based on explaining some observations that are done, but then making predictions of things that haven't been done. And both evolution and the Big Bang make predictions about things that weren't seen before. If, if the Big Bang happened, we were predicted, it was predicted, although a lot of scientists didn't know about it until after the fact, that there should be a universal background of radiation coming at us 
uh, that was once 3,000 degrees in temperature, that's now three degrees. That's been measured with exquisite prediction, yeah. or exquisite precision, sorry. And also we predict that 25% of the universe should be helium and almost 75% of the universe should be hydrogen and one part in 10 billion of the universe should be lithium. We go out and measure that, 10 orders of magnitude. So we make tons of predictions of things. That's what science is not just a story, like religion. It makes predictions, and if those predictions don't agree with observations, they're wrong. So, so we, throw the, we throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. So the histor that word historical science, which a lot of fundamentalists use to try and discredit evolution and the Big Bang, is nonsense because they're not historical any more than anything else. They make predictions about observations that are going to be made in the future. And every observation we made about the universe is consistent only with that picture and inconsistent with any other idea. Yeah, so you would say the evidence that we have for the Big Bang is as much evidence as we have that dinosaurs existed, right? It's just a different, that we have physical Yeah, and, more, and moreover, we have evidence that dinosaurs didn't exist when human ex <laughs> humans existed, no matter what they show in that silly So Ken creation. Ham's wrong, is Ken, that what you, yeah, uh, he's wrong? It's easy to say Ken Ham's wrong. Yeah, I've been there. I was there, there the day it opened. And, how how uh, do you feel about that? It was uh, a, a remarkable experience. I was there the day it opened, I, I, I flew to, to Cincinnati and then into Kentucky on the other side where it was that morning to lead, to be the keynote speaker in a protest that morning. And then, um, at, at, because it is, it, it's, it's that willingness, the, the sad, it's, it's child abuse. The idea is, okay, they believe something and, and therefore they don't want kids to know what really happened. They don't want kids to know that evolution happened because somehow it might reduce their faith in God. And so the idea that you want your kids to not know how the universe works because for fear that they'll lose their faith is no different than the Taliban when they won't teach their kids anything but, but memorizing the Quran. And, and, and so it's, it's worse than ignorance, it's, that it's, it's child abuse. So I, w so I went there and protested and then I actually, I had credentials, I was a commentator for NPR and I went up to right afterwards and they, they recognized me and they said, oh, Professor Krauss, your credentials didn't arrive, you can't go in the museum. <laughs> so I said, that's okay, I happen to have a crew from PBS and, and BBC that are following me right now, do you mind if they film me not being allowed in the museum? Uh. And then I got a, I got a tour by, at the time, the vice president of the museum and it was, it was, it was shocking, it's amazing. They do a bait and switch, it was amazing. And um, uh, they start out quite up front in the opening, saying, reason, and faith, they right in the front door, reason of faith, why sh and they point out that the two are different. And then they, and they, and they, and they try to argue, you should believe in reason, you should believe in faith, and then, and then they, halfway through the museum, they make it seem like a natural history museum, so they do this bait and switch, and, uh, but, the, but it's hysterical, because they have the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, both politically correct, Adam is in grass up to here, and Eve has hair down to there. Naturally. But they have dinosaurs, you know, in the Garden of Eden, of course, and the Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, is there, it's got sharp teeth. Why? Everything was a vegetarian in the Garden of Eden. You may not have realized that, but, but if you go to the museum, you'll discover that. I did not know. And it's so they could open pineapples. So they could eat, oh, that's why the Tyrannosaurus Rex had sharp teeth. So. Wow. You know, I knew I was going to learn something there you go. with you here today. I'm glad yeah. that that will end yeah. up being it. All right, yeah. we, only, we only have a couple minutes left. I'm curious, do you find that you have colleagues that believe in everything that you just said there, or, you know, everything yeah. that we've talked about, the, the, yeah. the ideas of everything you've said, but at the same time, are there some people that do take the leap of faith Oh, and, sure. And then, and then yeah. believe in things that aren't quantifiable sure. at the same time? Yeah. First, first, by the way, we should say, as scientists, we should never use the word believe. I, I, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's just, I fall into that trap, too. Believing is, you know, is not part of science. It's, is it likely or unlikely? And that's the question. Yeah. But of course, they're religious scientists. But as I like to say, they're scientists or Republicans. I mean, the scientists, believe it or not, are human beings. And human beings are, in some sense, hardwired to believe two mutually inconsistent things at the same time. I often say that we all have to believe 10 impossible things before breakfast just to get up in the morning. <laughs> you have to believe you like your job or your spouse or whatever. You, right. We all invent stories to go by. And so uh, there are scientists religious. As long as they don't let that religious faith interfere with their work, it, it doesn't matter. And, and the good scientists are that way. But, but, but the, making the claim that they're scientists or religious does not mean that they're compatible. Neither does making the claim that science derives from religion, because it does. I mean, but you know, in the history of the West, at least, all of universities were once religious institutions, because as I like to say, in the 17th century, the church was the National Science Foundation. It was the only place, if you wanted to get money, yeah. then that was the place to get it, if you wanted to support your ideas. So it's not too surprising that 
science grew out of religion. But as I also like to say, and again, to plug, said, and happen to say it in the new book, yep. that you know, children often move away from their parents, okay? And so, so talking about the background does not mean that, that science and religion are compatible because they're not. They're, they're not compatible in the sense of being compatible with the specific doctrines of the world's great religions. Science isn't incompatible with the vague notion that there might be purpose to the universe. There's no evidence of it whatsoever. Right. And there's no need for a God, as I showed in my last book. There's no need for even supernatural stuff to create a whole universe. But science can't disprove the notion of, of some vague deity, okay? But what it can say is, you know, the earth didn't stop when someone blew a trumpet, and there wasn't a virgin <laughs> birth, and all of those things, that's incompatible with what we know about the universe. Yeah, all right, we have two minutes left. Okay. What is one thing that people aren't thinking about that you are a, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, you're thinking of something on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis that the average person is not thinking about. Give me something that we, should, lots of things. that we should be thinking about that we're not. Well, I don't know whether we should, but something, um, something fun <laughs> is that the, um, is the future of the universe is, is uh, different than we might believe it might be. In fact, we, we may be living at a very special time in, in the history of the universe, and, and uh, when it turns out that what we've just discovered about the Higgs boson tells us that everything we see in the universe may be unstable, that, that matter as we know it could, not immediately, so don't go ahead and sell <laughs> your stocks or anything, yeah. but that the, in, the, in the far future, that not only we know the rest of the universe will disappear because it's already expanding away from us faster than the speed of light, at least it's receding from us faster than the speed of light. So the, and, and so the longer we wait, the less we'll, we'll be able to see of the universe. But it turns out that like an icicle on a window or an ice crystal on a window in, in a summer morning will eventually melt, the Higgs field that is allowing everything we now see to exist could eventually melt in a different kind of way. And if it does, then matter as we know it will disappear. So we should enjoy our brief moment in the sun. Yeah, so it's not gonna happen tomorrow, no. but and a long if, way if, in the future. If we're right, could... we're on the hairy edge of it. We, it may never happen, and we, what we're trying to discover at the Large Hadron Collider is will it happen, uh, or, or might it happen? But even if it was, we know it's not gonna happen for a heck of a long time. Yeah. So there's time to try and make sure we keep the present world working, which means we have to vote responsibly and ask yourself, when you hear something on TV, as, as the former publisher of the New York Times said, and I, I use as my mantra, I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. <laughs> All right, well, that's a perfect ending. I hope you'll come back in March when you do a, a proper press tour. And we okay, can, that'll we can be fun. Do this and, then uh, I can promote the book even more. You see, I'm publicly guilting you again. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's good. And it sometimes works. It's, occasionally it works. All right, well, for more on Lawrence's work, and there is a ton of it, and he's written a gajillion books, and we'll put the link down to, uh, to the new book right below. Uh, check out kraus.faculty.asu.edu. <laughs>